Welcome to another episode of Geographics. I'm your interim host, Eric Malachite, production manager and occasional writer for Geographics and Top Tens. And today we're going to be talking about the Holodomor, the Great Ukrainian Famine, authored by Larry Halsworth. Fair warning, though, this is going to be a very dark subject, hence why the cosmic horror author is covering it. But let's dive into it. In the immediate aftermath of the Russian Revolution of 1917, the Eastern European nation of Ukraine, formerly part of the Russian Empire, gained its independence. The revolution devolved into the Russian Civil War, which raged from late 1917 into 1923, involving several of the former states once ruled by the Tsars, including Ukraine. The largely agricultural nation found itself divided by the Bolshevik-leaning Soviet supporters, based in Kiev, and those favoring an independent Ukrainian republic, centered in Kharkov. After years of fighting in what history records as the Ukrainian-Soviet War, the Soviets prevailed, and in 1922, Ukraine became a member of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, under the firm control of the then-Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin. It was under Stalin that a catastrophic famine occurred in Ukraine in 1932 and 1933. Historians labeled this period the Holodomor, a portmanteau in Ukrainian meaning death by hunger, killing by hunger, murder by starvation, or one of several other translations, depending on the source. How many died during the famine is likewise disputed. Roughly 10% of Ukraine's population perished during the famine, somewhere between 3.5 and 5 million people. Starvation was not the only cause of death. Hunger and malnutrition led to diseases such as scurvy, typhus, malaria, dysentery, and others. To some, the Holodomor was a deliberate creation, a genocide commanded by Joseph Stalin. To others, it was a naturally occurring famine greatly worsened by inept Soviet leadership. Nearly all historians consider the Great Ukrainian Famine to have been a man-made event the result of Soviet policies and agricultural quote-unquote reforms. Yet its root causes and government reactions to it remain a subject of debate among scholars and historians, as well as international organizations and governments. As of 2023, 34 countries have labeled the Holodomor a genocide. Among them are the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and nearly all of Europe. Those same nations did little to address the famine when it occurred despite international reporting of the tragedy. Officially, Stalin's government denied its existence at the time. The Soviet government refused offers of aid from the Red Cross and other organizations, denying that there was a famine at all. Journalists who reported otherwise had their press credentials revoked, and foreign correspondents were ordered to leave the Soviet Union or face arrest and imprisonment. By 1933, when the famine was at its worst, foreign correspondents were restricted to Moscow and only allowed to travel elsewhere if accompanied by representatives of the Soviet government. Even the noted Western writer George Bernard Shaw fell victim to the Soviet denials, and in 1933 reported that during his escorted travels throughout the famine-stricken region, he did not see a single person undernourished. Certainly, Joseph Stalin was no stranger to mass murder. Yet even today, the question of whether the Ukrainian famine known as the Holodomor was a deliberate genocide or a tragically mismanaged natural event is debated. Not seriously, of course. In 2003, the United Nations General Assembly recognized the famine as a quote-unquote national tragedy. The Russian Federation, which evolved following the breakup of the Soviet Union, still officially denies the famine was an act of genocide. I guess if you're Russia, one can only consider the facts of the event and decide on their own. Beginning in 1928, the Soviet government in Moscow implemented the policy of collectivization in the grain-growing regions of Ukraine. Collectivization was the forced gathering of individual, privately owned farms into collectives called kolkhoys. Those were paid a wage. The crops were produced by the farms belonging to the state. Each union member state received a quota of produce to be collected by the Soviet Union for distribution throughout. The term collective referred to the fact that, on paper at least, the farms were owned collectively by the farmers who had previously owned and worked their own land. Many had existed for generations as subsistence farms, meaning they consumed what they produced, rather than selling most of their crops 
for profits. Those who resisted contributing lands and labor to the collectives were known as kulaks. Stalin's Soviet government created an extensive propaganda campaign condemning the kulaks as enemies of the state and the peoples of the Soviet Union. Enforcement of Soviet government policies was in the hands of local bureaucracies, which reported to the Ukrainian government. Corruption of local governments in the 1920s was rife. Kulaks existed because they could bribe or blackmail local authorities, or rely on familial relationships to avoid compliance with the law. The policy of collectivization was part of Joseph Stalin's first five-year plan, initiated in 1928. Under the plan, the benefits of collectivization were touted. Large collective farms, according to the plan, would benefit from modern agricultural equipment such as tractors and threshers. This would allow them to be more productive per acre than the smaller private farms, which relied on animal motive power, hand seeding, and manual harvesting. The collectives would also benefit from better irrigation techniques, fertilization, and organized and trained workforce. With that assumption in mind, quotas were established established regarding the amount of grain to be shipped from each administrative area, known as oblasts. Participation in the collective of each oblast was originally voluntary, which led to the aforementioned propaganda campaign condemning those who opted to remain kulaks. Stalin's five-year plan failed to take into account what every farmer around the world must contend with every year, the weather. Late 1927 and the first half of 1928 saw a drought throughout most of the grain-producing regions of Ukraine. The drought was severe enough that the Ukrainian government imposed regional rationing, beginning in Odessa in mid-1928 and later in several other regions, including Kherson, Maripol, and Kiev. Collectivization was affected by the drought. Though the few collectives which were established in 1928 generally had better yields per acre than the smaller kulaks, still collectivization advanced slowly. And in 1929, under prodding from the Soviet Central Committee, which is to say Stalin, it was made mandatory. In November 1929, Stalin published an article in Pravda, the Soviet State University, aka propaganda. The collectivization of Ukraine was to be quote unquote fast tracked, and decollectization became an established goal of the Soviet and by extension, the Ukrainian government. However, collectivization was not limited to grain. Livestock, including hogs, sheep, cattle, oxen, and goats, were also subject to production quotas. In December 1929, the Center Soviet Authority over Collectivization, known as the Kolka Center, established quotas for delivery of livestock at 100% of cattle and draft oxen 80% of hogs, and 60% of sheep and goats. This meant, simply put, that a farmer working on a collective had to surrender that number of animals and purchase meat for their own consumption from their wages earned, though at ration levels. To avoid the quotas, kulaks and many workers on collectives slaughtered their livestock surreptitiously. In January 1930, in order to ingratiate themselves with their masters in Moscow, the Ukrainian communist leaders established the policy of decollectization. Kulaks who refused to enter into collectives were collectivized by force. Farms, crops, livestock, and equipment were seized, and families deported to the north, a Soviet euphemism for the gulags in Siberia. Many fled to Central Asia and to the lands east of the Ural Mountains. Others stayed in Ukraine to resist, and peasant revolts dotted the country. The displaced kulaks were replaced by workers from urban areas throughout the Soviet Union, known as the, and I quote, 25,000ers. These workers, of which over 70% were members of the Communist Party, received training before being deployed to Ukraine and other Soviet republics, both in technical disciplines such as agricultural management and in party doctrine. Their mission was to both improve existing collective farms and to create new collectives at the expense of the displaced kulaks. The combination of the 25,000ers and the policy of decollectization led to the displacement of over 200,000 Ukrainian families in 1930 and 1931, and their farms were completely absorbed into collectives. By the beginning of 1932, roughly 71% of Ukrainian farmland 
was in collectives. However, the policy of collectivization ran into a significant hurdle. Large industrialized farms, the goal of collectivization, required industrial equipment to be productive. The industrialization of the Soviet industrial economy lagged behind the industrialization of agriculture. There was just not enough modern farm equipment to make the larger farms productive. The final nail in the coffin was a shift in the produce to be grown at Ukrainian farms, areas which had for generations grown wheat and oats largely for subsistence, were directed to grow crops for exports such as sugar beets and cotton. The Soviet government wanted to increase trade with foreign nations and thus demanded crops which would improve their balance of trade. The first food shortages, which began in 1930, led the Soviet government to requisition food crops beyond the already established quotas. Any hiding of food or evading the requisitions was considered to be theft, punishable by 10 years imprisonment. As crop yields decreased, Soviet quotas for delivery increased. The immediate result was famine in the regions where most Soviet grain was produced. By 1932, most Ukrainian farmers worked on collectives, on land they had once owned. They paid for their homes out of their wages and purchased their food, often that they had grown themselves, based on a system of rationing. Collectivization had also led to changes in their social lives. Churches, an important factor of rural life in Ukraine, were largely closed during collectivization. Soviet authorities ordered the arrest of Orthodox priests. Church schools were either closed or secularized. In August 1932, as famine swept across Ukraine and other Soviet republics, the Central Executive Committee and the Council of People's Commissars in Moscow issued a decree. The official story is that it was issued to protect the state property of the collectives, and that also included among that property the crops produced. When Moscow learned of thefts of grain and other produce by peasants suffering from the famine Stalinist policies had created. The theft of foodstuffs from warehouses, shipping yards, rail cars, barns, and even the fields themselves were all covered under the decree. It became known as the Spikelets Decree. Spikelets referred to grain left behind in the fields after harvest, where presumably it would merely rot. Peasants roaming the fields in search of such meager provisions visions were in violation of that decree, meaning they were subject to punishment by execution or lesser penalties, including transportation to the gulags. Their families may or may not have been charged as well and subject to the same penalty. Kulaks were, by definition, guilty of stealing state property, since participation in collectives had been made mandatory. As food shortages developed into famine in 1932, Ukrainians unable to obtain bread to feed themselves began to leave the country for other Soviet republics. The Soviet famine, lasting through 1933, of which the Great Ukrainian Famine was a part of, spread across most of the grain-producing areas of the USSR, including Russia, the Urals, Kazakhstan, and parts of the Caucasus, and even Western Siberia. In all of these regions, including Ukraine, there occurred a widespread and extended drought. Its contribution to the ensuing famine is likewise debated. The same holds true for various crop diseases and pestilence. During the period of famine in Ukraine, the country produced crops in numbers sufficient to feed its own population. The same is true for the amounts of livestock produced by the collective farms. Yet the fruit of the farmers' labors did not remain to feed the local populations. Instead, they were demanded by Moscow to feed Stalin's international trade ambitions. The communist central government increased the already unrealistic quotas for Ukraine's agricultural regions. In some cases, up to 150% of what was actually produced. In Ukraine, the failure to comply with what was mathematically impossible led to even more repressive policies. Secret police moved to enforce the quotas, even confiscating food from the larders of Ukrainian families. Even the seed set aside to ensure future plantings was seized as contraband, and those holding it arrested for stealing the property of the state. Starving families in the afflicted regions who attempted to flee were arrested and forced to return. 
lest stories of the famine reach Western ears. Passports required to travel between the various Soviet republics came under closer scrutiny by Soviet authorities. Travel between several republics, including Ukraine, was curtailed. Yet word of the famine in the Soviet Union began to appear as early as 1931. The reports were published anonymously, allowing Stalin to credibly claim they were false. He pointed to the increase of Soviet grain exports as evidence there was no shortage of foodstuffs in the Soviet Union. During the years of the famine, Soviet grain exports to the West decreased and did not achieve the goals established by the Soviet. This led to continually increasing quotas on the food producing regions, which were already starving and could not possibly meet the increased demand. In October of 1931, British journalist Gareth Jones anonymously published three consecutive articles in the Times, each under the title The Real Russia. The articles described Jones's observations in southern Ukraine and his encountering starving peasants who cried for bread, many asking him to request aid from Britain. The articles had little impact on the British public, and when they were reprinted in the United States in several newspapers, they likewise generated little support for Ukraine. The Western world was, by then, in the throes of the Great Depression, and though the worst of the Dust Bowl had yet to take place in the United States, there were already food shortages, soup kitchens, and despair among much of the populace. Concern over events in the Soviet Union was not an American priority. In March 1933, Jones visited the Soviet Union again and accepted an invitation to visit some collective farms in southern Russia. He left the train carrying him and his escort about 40 miles from the border with Ukraine and wandered across the countryside on his own. Jones had been invited to visit by a member of the German consulate at Kharkov and had traveled to Russia from Berlin. On March 29, 1933, having returned to Germany, he released a press statement from Berlin, which was printed in the New York Post in America, the Manchester Guardian in Britain, and numerous other newspapers and magazines in the Western world. Jones wrote of the peasants he encountered, and I quote, We are waiting for death, was my welcome. But see, we still have our cattle fodder. Go farther south, they have nothing. Many houses are empty of people already dead they cried. He described peasants scrambling to retrieve crusts of bread from spittoons in which they had been thrown by observers, including himself. He further reported that he had been warned by soldiers not to travel at night, and I quote, as there were many starving, desperate men. According to Jones, he frequently observed cattle fodder being eaten by peasants, who informed him they were better off than others to the south, who had not even that to eat. Instead of remaining anonymous, this time Jones had his name in the byline for the release. Two days following the appearance of Jones's report, the New York Times published an article by their resident correspondent in Moscow, Walter Duranti. In 1932, Duranti had received the Pulitzer Prize for a series of reports on the Soviet Union. His reports described the Soviet peoples as more Asiatic than Western in temperament and culture. He favorably reported on the efforts of Stalin and the Soviet government to unify such a diverse collection of peoples and cultures and praised Stalin's fire. Five year plan. In his reports on the claims of Gareth Jones, Durante claimed they were untrue, and I quote, scare story, and covered them with a headline which read, and I quote, Russians hungry, but not starving. He quoted sources within the Kremlin who denied the existence of a famine. Durante did acknowledge increases in mortality within the afflicted regions, but ascribed them to, and I quote, diseases due to malnutrition. In April, Jones published a detailed analysis of his own observations in the Financial Times. He described the famine as a catastrophe and laid blame for its existence squarely on the Soviet policy of collectivization. The following month, May 1933, Jones published a rebuttal of Durante's report in the New York Times. Jones pointed out that much of the information quoted by Durante had come from consuls and other diplomats, who were restricted as to what they could say to the press by the policies of their respective governments. And I quote, Hence they give famine the polite name of food shortage, and starving to death is softened down to read as widespread mortality from diseases due to malnutrition. The Soviet government responded by issuing a lifetime ban on Gareth Jones from ever visiting the Soviet Union again. He was later kidnapped and murdered while 
while reporting on Japanese transgressions in China in 1935. Durante returned to the United States, remained under retainer with the New York Times, and spent several months per year in Moscow. He implied the Great Ukrainian Famine was a creation of British anti-Soviet propaganda, and later wrote several books on Soviet policies and politics, most of them unsurprisingly favorable of Stalinist ideals. Despite the reports in the Western press and pressure from the International Red Cross and other organizations, the Soviet government continued to deny the existence of a famine. It also refused offers of assistance from such organizations. In March 1933, in the Kiev region of Ukraine, the secret police received reports of cannibalism among the populace, often as many as 10 or more per day. In Ukraine, during 1932 through 1933, over 2,500 people were arrested for and convicted of cannibalism. The penalty for such a conviction was death. In civilized societies, nothing could be more horrific than the killing of one's own children to serve as a food source, yet the evidence that it occurred in Ukraine and other Soviet republics during the famine is overwhelming. In the book Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine, author Anne Applebaum relates that one woman, asked why she had killed her child for food, replied that the child would not have survived anyway, but this way she would. In another work, Cannibal, The History of the People Eaters, the authors refer to the Great Ukrainian Famine and report that, and I quote, the availability of human flesh at the market was an open and acknowledged secret. People were glad of any kind of meat. Because, you know, they were starving. As with the famine itself, the Soviet authorities suppressed any information regarding reports of cannibalism. Not until after the fall of the Soviet Union and the opening of records beginning in the 1990s have researchers and scholars been able to learn of and report on the extent of cannibalism during the Holodomor. <laughs> As previously noted, nearly three dozen countries consider the Holodomor and the Great Ukrainian Famine a deliberate genocide, planned and executed by Joseph Stalin to exterminate the Ukrainian people and destroy Ukrainian nationalism. Others claim the famine to have been a man-made event, caused by incompetent Soviet authorities and worsened by natural causes such as plant diseases and poor growing conditions. Yet during this period, Soviet quotas on Ukraine Ukrainian grain were increased beyond the capacity of its fields to produce. Grain in storage from previous harvests was confiscated and placed under the control of the Soviet Union's central government, while the people of Ukraine starved. Records discovered and researched after the fall of the communist government and the collapse of the Soviet Union revealed that Stalin was well aware of the famine at the time it occurred, and acknowledged its impact on the Ukrainian people. According to Professor Andrea Graziozzi of the University of Naples, the Holodomor was, and I quote, methodically planned out and perpetrated by depriving the very people who were producers of food of their nourishment. Stalin made clear his desire to eliminate the Kulaks, and those who believed the Holodomor to have been a genocide cite this desire to support their views. In the late 1930s, the Soviet Politburo wrote the official history of the Ukrainian famine. It blamed the catastrophe on the Kulaks, which led to mistakes and accidents by the Soviet government in attempting to suppress their corruption and resistance. Natural events, such as minor droughts, apparently exacerbated the problem, which was never as bad as anti-communist propaganda led the world to believe. Can you believe that that is still the position of the Russian Federation, which denies both the Holodomor and an attempt at genocide in Ukraine in the 1930s? In August 2015, a Russian website known as Sputnik published an article titled Holodomor, Hoax, Joseph Stalin's Crime That Never Took Place. It asserted that the Holodomor quote-unquote myth was born of the tensions between the West and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. As for calling the famine a genocide or even a man-made event, the article states flatly, and I quote, this perspective, however, is wrong and that it, and I quote, was far from the intention of Stalin and others in the Soviet leadership to create such a disaster. The article claims the first to create the myth of the Holodomor were the Nazis during the German invasion of the Soviet Union to stir up anti-Soviet sentiment. But I will remind you that the European Parliament and 34 nations have stated that the Holodomor was indeed a genocide. <laughs> 
perpetrated through deliberately planned famine on the Ukrainian people. In 2003, 23 nations signed a United Nations document which stated, in part, and I quote, We deplore the acts and policies that brought about mass starvation and death of millions of people. To the Russian government, the Holodomor is a myth created by the enemies of the Russian people, built upon a few failed harvests, and exploited first by the Germans during World War II and later by the instruments of the Cold War. So I hope you enjoyed that video, or at the very least found it uh, both educational and enlightening. I certainly found the script to be both of those things. Big thanks to Larry Holdsworth for the excellent script. Make sure you follow him at any of the links if he's provided them. My links will be below if you want to check those out, should you choose. And uh, also check out my books, I guess, on Amazon and any other sites where they're at. Be sure to subscribe to Geographics, like this video, share it with a friend who loves deep dives into biographies and geographies. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time, Space Cowboy.